microscopy uh, a little earlier than we are, but um, now that now that he's here, I just wanted to introduce Professor Steve Lane, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at CBST, uh, as well as my, my boss uh, over at the center. He's got a background in, uh, in physics back at North Southern Lab, and uh, is now overseeing most of the research projects. So, yeah. so he's going to give the introduction to the microscopy. So this is it. You, you were the class. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so what? You, can you give me your names? No, my name's Colin. Colin. Okay. My name's Melissa. Melissa. Where okay. did he see you do this? What? <laughs> oh, so uh, B I M two forty two. Yeah, I think Biomedical I'll ask you, but I'm gonna say. Oh, did you? So did, you've heard this before, also? Is that right? Probably, but it was over a year ago. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. Year, yeah. I try to, ten, you know, try to yeah. upgrade it a little bit every year. So I don't really, I probably don't remember it. And I need to learn. Okay. I mean, I learned my own. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Elon, he he just heard this uh, yeah. a few weeks ago. So uh, anyway. I've heard um, Melissa works with Simon Sherry. Oh, okay. And then uh, Colin is working with Jack Rutledge. Oh, fantastic. Uh, with Thomas. Right, Thomas. That's where half these geographs came from. So uh, great. So what are you working on? Uh, I, I work with bacteria. Okay, great. I work with bacteria in the gut. Okay. I can see how I can use some of these techniques to image oh, the fantastic. physiology and what's going on. Okay. Well, I don't know if it's even possible after the end of the course, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Actually, maybe later I'll, there's some other things that don't involve imaging that are happening at CBST. Maybe Frank has mentioned. Is, is James going to give a lecture? He's going to give a Oh, okay. Okay. So, there'll be a whole lecture on other things. So, so they're doing bacteria studies, individual okay. bacteria studies. Yeah, yeah, no, with um, it's called laser trap raw <coughs> models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Tom, Tom did use that. Yeah. yeah. So you'll have a whole hour on that. And then, what kind of do you, you do imaging, pet imaging, or? Uh, yeah, I'm working on stem cell imaging using oh, pets. Fantastic. It's good thing and better spatial. Okay, so they're labeled stem cells. Uh, with yes, they obviously are. labeled yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's some. That's pretty cool. You know, sometimes people say, well, maybe we should just also use optical, right? Like, closer to sort of. Yeah. Um, so, one of the other members of the center, Chris Contag at Stanford University, is sort of an expert on bioluminescent imaging. So he makes, um, I think they have uh, bioluminescent stem cells. And they can track them in mice. Oh, that's awesome. yeah, yeah, anyway. Okay, so this is sort of a survey of uh, microscopy. Fairly informal, relaxed. So, any questions you want to ask, or if you get. Uh, so, I heard from your conversation earlier that neither one of your physical science, your book, biology. Well, I'm an engineer. Oh, okay. Well, that's. I'm a biologist. Okay, okay. So, um, the way this is structured is that, you know, there were five lectures in BIM 242, and um, the first one was on sort of the fundamentals of light and how it interacts with tissue. So this kind of assumes that you might know that already, but so we might... Um, well, we did get a lecture. Our second lecture was uh, basis of... Oh, okay, great. So, okay, perfect. So maybe you know this. Uh, okay, so I'll just launch into this. So um, this is a view graph up in the corner that I got from um, one of our colleagues that we used to work with at UCSF, um, just uh, emphasizing the importance of optical microscopy. So he claimed he got this, just randomly picked this uh, off the shelf, this journal, and he put a little post-it uh, on every article, a uh, yellow post on every article involved optical microscopy and then a green one on other uh, forms of imaging. Just to make the point that um, using microscopy is probably the most common tool in, in biology and in uh, uh, medical research. Um, and, and the reason for that is it's incredible, you know, it's like 400 years old, first of all, so it's very well understood, it's very well developed, it's very mature, um, and there's all sorts of techniques that allow you to look non-destructively at living cells, and that's why people use uh, optical microscopy for the most part. Um, so here's some examples. So you can, uh, one of the c very common techniques is uh, getting fluorescent labels and um, 
uh, arranging it so that those labels go to structures in the cell that you're interested in, and then you can use different color labels uh, to image to uh, that attach to different structures so you can get a multicolored image like this one here, which is apparently a, a hamster ovary uh, cell, and it's labeling these uh, chromosomes, and the uh, telomeres are in green, and these I think these spoke proteins that pull the chromosomes apart are, are in red. So you can see all these things simultaneously. Yeah, so that's the, uh, for the most part, um, except for ultraviolet light, uh, on average, light doesn't have enough energy to break bonds or ionize. So you can look at things for hours, days. I mean, that's one of the huge advantages, is that the <coughs> optical photons, unlike x-rays, don't... Now, if you turn up the intensity, you can certainly cook things, and there are always a few you know, uh, even optical wavelengths, uh, uh, occasionally you will break a bond or two, but it's, you know, it's it, it can be inconsequential, so. It's interesting, it's actually pretty important when you're talking about uh, electromagnetic radiation, the question of whether it's ionizing or not ionizing. Right? So, for example, if you're treating cancer with uh, radiation, that's using ionizing radiation. The idea there is that you're taking electrons out of, out of their orbitals, and so the chemical bond is basically a fair share of electrons there. Right? So when you, when you take an electron out of there, then you destroy the chemical bond and basically destroy that molecule. But light generally is not an ionizing. So, so in this case, you don't need to worry about creating the chemical bond. Maybe like X ray. Or ultraviolet light, things like that. So. Did you have the impression that it did? I just want to stop over me. I was just thinking if you were in a single cell, I, I don't know, I'm just talking in my head if it was. Yeah, so they <laughs> usually. And then the other thing is you can uh, make measurements at different angles and then have computers reconstruct the image so you can get, you can do what's called tomography. Um, Basically, seeing you know three things in 3D. Is it, or do yeah. use that you know, I know there. Are, uh, typically, no. Um, so there are two channel endoscopes, so you get two views to match, you know, your eyes, so that you get a little bit of 3D. No, but usually tomography is there's a wide range of angles that you view the sample with. And then you can kind of reconstruct a 3D image. So you probably do tomography. Right? Yeah. So if you were going to do tomography and then just go around. Yeah. Well, I was thinking since the computer will. Yeah. What, well, what the computer does, it takes the images you've taken and reassembles them in a new way. It can't produce new information, or it doesn't usually. So different colors, 3D. Uh, you can make real-time movies. So this is a fruit fly embryo. Um, so you can watch, you know, the dynamics of of the sample. Here's another great picture. So this is watching fruit fly embryo cells going through uh, cell division. I think they, in this movie they go through. Well, the, the light's not great here, but the, they go through two sets of divisions. Could we turn the should we turn the light down? You think? <laughs> Better, I think. Yeah, not great though. Anyway, so maybe afterwards. It's a pretty pretty neat picture. Um, and so then, um, you know, we'll talk about link scales all the time. So typically. This is the kind of view you get from a microscope. So it's a few microns uh, field of view, and you can see um, down to objects that are a few hundred or a few tenths of a micron. So uh, maybe I'll try to just maybe confine to one uh, one link scale. So we'll call it nanometers. So so this is like two uh, two thousand nanometers. And a nanometer is a you know, billionth of a meter. Um, 
and this is a hundred or a couple hundred uh, nanometers. And that's the best resolution you can get unless you use some tricks, which we'll, you know, we'll discuss some tricks in, in a few minutes. Um, so what you can see then is organelles, interior structures within cells. Um, you can certainly see things bigger than that. You can see whole cells and you can see, you know, clusters of cells in tissue and, and so forth. What you have a hard time seeing is you can't see um, sort of protein complexes or protein um, machines which are, uh, that are less than 100 nanometers. You certainly can't see these uh, uh, small protein complexes and you can't see large molecules or small mo molecules. So, um, so just remember that microscopes, the limit to what they can see is like 200 nanometers. And that's kind of um, you can see some structures of, of organelles within cells, but not at any, uh, not with any great uh, detail. And so, of course, uh, that this is the big deficiency in microscopy is most of the things you want to see. Um, maybe it's because you've already seen the larger things, but most of the things you want to see are smaller than than what the resolution of the microscope is. So that's so. So the advantages are you can there are all these labels so you can label things of interest you can do 3D uh, you can do movies and watch dynamics and the one and it doesn't hurt the cell you can watch it forever but the one thing you can't do is see down to the level of protein complexes or our larger uh, or larger uh, uh, protein structures so that's the big disadvantage. Um, and this just, reinforces, just reiterates that. So with your naked eye, you can see, um, you know, a couple hundred microns, which is like the diameter of the human hair. Uh, with a light microscope, we said you can see down to about 200 nanometers. <coughs> with an electron microscope, you can actually see down to the size of a few atoms. But with electron microscopes, you can't see any dynamics. The, the cells are... Um, are usually fixed and then they're sliced so that they're very thin sections. Um, so they're, and, it's, and it's complicated. It's, it's, uh, it requires a lot of cell preparation. Often the slices are frozen uh, using cryogenic techniques. Um, and, and I'll show you a few techniques where, uh, that have resolutions that go beyond the resolution of a normal optical microscope. Okay, so, you know, uh, kind of skim over this. So the microscope was invented in somewhere in the, uh, within this 20 years, 1790 to 1610, either by these brothers, uh, the Janssen brothers, or actually Galileo claimed that he invented the microscope as well. So there's some debate. But anyway, so you can see microscopes have been around for a couple hundred years. Um, these two guys... Uh, ben Lowenhock and Hook uh, were the first ones to use it. Ben Lowenhock uh, discovered bacteria. Hook actually named, uh, he discovered cells, and he gave uh, in cork trees, in the bark of cork trees, he found individual cells, and he said they looked like the rooms that uh, monks stayed in, in and they were called cells in a monastery. And so that's where the word cell comes from. Um, and so then there's various developments. So this is interesting. This guy worked out the theory of how microscopes work. Uh, Abby, he worked in Carl Zeiss's lab. And Carl Zeiss is still a large microscope company and was one of the first microscope companies. Um, and uh, this guy Zernike invented a new, another way of doing microscopy that we'll talk about called phase contrast, and he got the Nobel Prize. So, And even, actually, I would say in the last... Uh, maybe five years. There's kind of a, a revolution of new techniques to be that are being used um, to extend the resolution of microscopes, and so uh, so that's roughly the development line. And so simple microscopes. They usually consist of just two lenses or two groups of lenses, an objective and an eyepiece. And so you have you usually have the sample, and then the sample is either illuminated from underneath or from above. And you have an objective lens, and that typically can uh, give a magnification of a factor of 100. And then you have an eyepiece that gives another factor of 10. So you get kind of a factor of 1,000 
increase in resolution. And newer uh, microscopes have a third lens called a tube lens, and that's usually used because most most high-end microscopes now, you don't look through a, a, a eyepiece. You ha there's a camera, a CCD camera, that records the image. And so they're kind of configured to use CCD cameras instead of, instead of eyes. They, most of them you still can see something through the eye, but the really the high-quality imaging is done with a camera. And then furthermore, uh, modern microscopes often you insert something in them like filters or a mirror that allows uh, light to come in um, that you, you can use for illumination purposes so they have this what's called a conjugate image plane so here this tube lens takes a uh, diverging rays from the sample this is the objective lens here's a, a couple uh, sources and these rays trace where the, the light goes and so you have uh, diverging light, and then it's changed into so semi-parallel uh, uh, light, and then the uh, eyepiece turns it back into um, converging uh, light. And so then there's a so-called conjugate plane where you can put other, uh, other devices. So that's a crude uh, uh, schematic of what a modern microscope looks like. And then the microscopes can be very complicated, having all sorts of uh, added parts, um, multiple imaging screens and so forth, and they can actually be quite simple. So one of the guys in the, uh, at at the Center for Biophotonics has invented a very a small lens that you can put on, for instance, a camera phone or the camera uh, in the cell phone, and you can get actually pretty good magnification. You can see down to five microns. Okay, so a little about the theory of uh, microscopes. It turns out uh, when you work through the math that um, uh, one of the things that determines how high magnification you can possibly get is the amount of light you collect. And so the larger this angle is, the higher the magnification uh, that's possible. So here this shows, a, here's a, a source of light and this shows a lens, uh, this is a scenario where you only collect a small amount of the light, and on the right-hand side is a scenario where you're catching a large amount of light, and same over here. So here's a lens where you catch only a small amount, and here's a lens that catches a large amount. So the, uh, the amount that you catch determines, that's a factor in determining what the ultimate resolution is. And one way to quantify that, there's something called the numerical aperture, and that's equal to the uh, index of refraction of the surrounding material, if it's air, which was in this situation, or if it's oil. Actually, oil has a larger um, index of refraction, so it allows you to collect this larger angle, which leads to a higher resolution. Uh, and then maybe you're more familiar with like the F number on a camera lens, um, and the F number is equal to the focal length of the, of the lens divided by the diameter of the lens and then that's related to the numerical aperture just by that little formula. But the thing to remember here is if, if you want to uh, get high resolution, you need to collect a, a light from a large angle. And here's the formula um, for the resolution. So R is the resolution. I'll explain what, R act, you know, what the meaning of R is for a second. But you like R to be as small as possible. Uh, and that gives you the highest resolution. And so to, to get... Uh, to make R as small as possible, you'd like the numerical aperture to be as large as possible. And again, that means you'd like to collect as much light as you can. And you'd like the wavelength to be as short as you can. So the, um, but there's a sort of trade-off here in that um, the shorter the wavelength is, the more likely it is to uh, damage the sample. And also, the less penetrating it is. So there's kind of... Uh, so if this was... Uh, like ultraviolet light, which is say 400 nanometers, then uh, you get uh, good resolution, but you probably damage the sample pretty quickly. If you, if uh, you, and and the light wouldn't penetrate very deeply. If so, if you're looking at the <coughs> tissue, you'd only be able to see the surface of the tissue. So if, if it was 600 nanometer light, uh, then uh, you get the the resolution would be less good, but um, 
Uh, on the other hand, the light penetrates more and doesn't damage the cell. So there's always this kind of trade-off. Typically, people work in the 500 to 600 nanometer range. That's where lasers also operate. And then, um, yeah, I, I just sort of skip over the details here of, what, of the definition of resolution. But, uh, but I'll also mention that um, that uh, the, the, even if you had an absolutely perfect lens because of uh, diffraction, you still uh, you, you, if you have a point source, so imagine you have one uh, point of light that's it's very small, smaller than you can resolve, and it'll produce um, an intensity like this in the camera that you're viewing with, so sort of Gaussian shape, and you can't get any better than that because of uh, of uh, diffraction, because of the wavelength of the light, and even if you had perfect lenses and everything, you can't get better, you can't improve over that. Um, and uh, you certainly can do worse by having, you know, there can be aberrations in the lens. And then there's also noise, you know, so the, when uh, you're detecting individual photons, and so there's like flipping coins. There, you, you know, you, you, there's going to be a certain, it's called shot noise um, or statistical noise. So that's going to kind of add to the uh, noisiness of these curves and make it uh, even harder to resolve tiny things. Um, okay, so then uh, one of the, so typically objectives don't consist of just a single lens, it consists of multiple lens, maybe up to a dozen small lenses, all packed into a small cylinder. And the reason for that is that they want to correct various things. And one of the things they want to correct is uh, called chromatic aberration. And that's the fact that different wavelengths of light will focus at different places. So here's an example of that. Here's these three different wavelengths of light. And you can see that they focus at three different places. So the dotted line focuses in front of, say, this is the camera surface or the focal plane of the camera. Uh, the dotted line focuses in front. The uh, solid line focuses right at the focal plane. And then the uh, dash line focuses behind it. So if you have a, a sample with different colors, if you only use one lens, then you know you can adjust the uh, the camera so that one of the colors is in focus, but the others will be out of focus. So that's an undesirable situation. So now you have multiple lenses uh, that are all designed to to correct for this, and uh, so that's that's one reason why objectives are complicated and have these dozen or so individual. Uh, lenses, make a sort of compound lens. The other thing you'd like to make sure of is that objects at the edge of the field are in just as sharp a focus as objects in the middle. So, and various other uh, aberrations you'd like to correct. Okay, so that's the, uh, you know, five minutes or ten minutes on the basics of microscopes. Now what I thought I'd do is kind of go through these different cases so there, and I've divided into two sets. So one are sort of conventional ways of using microscopes, and the other are more advanced ways. Um, you know, we might just skip over some of these. I mean, some are a little more relevant than others. It's, it's a long list, but I'll kind of try to cruise through it in as painless way as possible. So uh, conventional microscopes. Okay, so here's, a, you know, like a student microscope. And typically, you can use these microscopes, you know, common standard microscopes in two ways. You put the sample on a, in a, typically in a slide, and then you can illuminate the, the slide from either below, and that's called transmission or absorption microscopy, or you can illuminate it from above, and that's called reflection microscopy. And so one technique for using transmission microscopy is you take a cell, and you cut the cell into... Uh, thin slices. You put the slices on a transparent microscope slide, and then you stain the slide, typ typically, uh, so that different structures in the slide are, have different colors. And then you shine light through the sample, and the light goes through because it's thin, and this is the kind of image that you get. Um, again, an alternate way is to illuminate from above, and now you're looking at the surface of the sample. So now the sample doesn't have to be thin anymore because you're just looking at the top surface. So now light comes from some source, 
it's reflected off of what's called a um, uh, uh, dichroic mirror, and so now the light uh, is, um, or it's a partially reflecting mirror, so now the light is redirected onto the sample, and then the light that is uh, reflected from the sample uh, can pass through the mirror, and some of it goes through without getting reflected, and then it's directed towards the eyepiece. So that's called reflection microscopy. And there's actually a third scheme, a third illumination scheme called dark field microscopy. And this is, so here's an example of how this works. So here is a window panes, and on the window pane are uh, uh, spider webs. And so if you just look directly through the pane, you can't see anything because the, you can't see the web because um, most of the light is just passing through it. But if you illuminate from the side, now most of the light is, um, is passing from one side of the object to the other. And it's only the light that gets scattered by this object and scattered into the eye or into the, into the microscope that you can see. So, so that's why uh, dark field microscopy or basically side illumination can be uh, useful in certain situations. The light is coming, say, from the right side and moving to the left side. So if there was no object there, you wouldn't see any. These panes would just be black. It's only, the, it's only because the object is able to scatter some of the light 90 degrees, and now it comes out in our direction, and now you can see that light. So if you took the web away, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see anything. Now, in this case, the light is, all of it's coming in our direction from the other side, from the outside. And so the, the small amount that's either absorbed or scattered by the web is totally invisible. It's like trying to see stars at night. You know, you can't see the stars because the sunlight is too... Is it any degree reflection specific to that? No. Yeah, I mean, this uh, scatters in all directions. And so it's the, it's the light that's roughly coming 90 degrees oh, that you see. Okay, so it's not just... No, it's not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's the next step. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so here's a scheme for seeing single gold particles. So these are particles that, um, they're very small, 60 nanometers. That's far below the resolution uh, of a usual microscope. And normally, if you shine light on these tiny things, you wouldn't be able to see anything. But here's a... Here's a situation where the light is coming in from the side, and so uh, if there weren't any particles, you would just see a black background, but with these small particles, they scatter light, uh, again, sort of 90 degrees and up into the camera. And so that's a way of seeing these very small particles, um, you know, that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. Is there a lower limit for how small the gold particles can be? No, I mean, they're... Again, this is like, these are like stars, so they're well below, you can't actually measure the size of these particles, nor can you, with your eye, measure the size of a star either. I mean, but you can certainly see that there's some source of light there, and uh, because it's separated from, you know, they're isolated points. So same deal here. So I, there's no, if you had a single atom that was emitting uh, enough light to see, you, you'd be able to see it this way. But you, again, seeing it and resolving it are two different things. But if you may, yeah, in the emitter, I would understand, let's say something with a gold nanoparticle is small, it's like five or ten nanoparticles. Doesn't matter. Yeah. It's still scatter yeah. light. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, will it, is the question, will it scatter light, or yeah. is it that you'll see it? No, no, no. Well, if, it, if it scatters, you'll see it, I agree. Yeah, but okay. Will it scatter? Yeah, so it depends on the wavelength of the. So usually small. Uh, particles scatter short wavelengths, and so these are tuned to scatter optical wavelengths. So if you had five nanometer uh, particles, you would probably need ultraviolet light, or depending on the material that it's made out of. Okay, polarization. So here's another. Con these are called contrast mechanisms. So we talked about absorption. Uh, we talked about reflection. And so this is polarization. So here they've, fitted, they've added a couple new components to the microscope. They've added a polarizer here uh, between the source and the, and the uh, objective lens. So now all the light that's coming into the microscope is all polarized. Its uh, electric field is only in one direction. 
And then there's what's called an analyzer. So that's another polarizer who, and the angle can be changed. So if the polarization angle of this, of the analyzer was in the same direction as the, um, as the polarizer here at the source end, all the light would come through. If it was at 90 degrees, uh, none of the light would come through until you put a sample in, and certain samples have the ability to rotate the angle of polarization. So they're, they're uh, optically active. And so here's some examples of those sorts of, of objects. And so even though most of the light <coughs> passes through it and it has very low contrast in the sense of the reflection absorption, it does rotate the angle of polarization so that it shows up in the microscope. So it's called polarization microscopy. <clears throat> okay, next scheme is called phase contrast. And so this uses the fact that when you have um, some monochromatic light and it's, um, uh, you know, the best situation would be, be like laser light. If, if you have two waves and the peaks and valleys line up, then they, what's called constructively interfere, and the peaks and valleys become stronger. If they, uh, if, if they don't line up, and in fact, worst case, if the peaks line up uh, with the valleys, then you get destructive interference, and the, the amount of the, the intensity of light becomes uh, much less. And so, how is this used? Typically, cells don't absorb a lot of light because they're pretty uh, transmissive. And so, um, so in this case, we, we start out with two uh, uh, wavelengths, or uh, two uh, uh, waves of light. And they're, they start out, at, they are, you know, they're in phase. The peaks line up with the peaks and the valley lines up with the valley. And so now the normal way of doing microscopy is you look at the change of intensity as uh, when the light comes through the, the cell. And so here you've got a kind of reference wave that doesn't go through the cell and then, a, and then a wave that does go through the cell and some of the light gets absorbed, a small amount of it gets absorbed and so now the, the amplitude of the light wave is reduced. But it's not reduced a huge amount. Now, another way of doing this is by recombining the reference wave and the wave that went through the sample. And now, <coughs> in addition to the wave being absorbed, you also get a little phase shift. And now, instead of the peaks lining up, now they don't line up anymore. In fact, they're perfectly out of phase, and, and the end result is that the intensity coming out of the cell is... is almost zero, so you get a huge contrast. So here's an example of, so this is without phase contrast, this is situation A, we're just looking at the amplitude, and then this is with phase contrast. And so because these things are completely out of phase now, the light that went through the cell, you know, gets, uh, is strongly attenuated, or at least when you see it, when you recombine the reference waves. So that's why you get this dramatic change in contrast, and that's called phase contrast microscopy. Need, so do you need to start with coherent light somehow? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, somehow. Yeah, I mean, there's various ways of doing that, even with white light. You can, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And or you can arrange it so that, you know, you've, you're comparing waves, even though, you know, there can be a lot of other waves present that are all, um, not necessarily in phase, but you, you know, you use the ones that are in phase. You know. And then I'll skip over this. This is a kind of uh, further level of sophistication of, uh, of phase contrast microscopy, but I won't take the time to explain it. It's, it's basically the same idea. And, and many, if not most, modern high-end microscopes have the ability to do, it's called DIC, differential interference contrast. But you know, in the end, it's the same thing. Okay, so now, uh, one of the most common forms of cellular microscopy is fluorescence microscopy. And here, it's the idea of, like we saw at the very beginning, of taking fluorescent labels and labeling different parts of the cell with different color labels. And the way those microscopes work, it's often there's different color uh, light sources so that you can excite different 
different types of fluorescent dyes. And then um, what's not shown here, though, is you also can um, have different filters so that you can separate different colors of light that are emitted by the object. So this shows simply, and these, are, these things are filters here, and they're often filter wheels or filters that allow one color of light to go through but not other colors. And so here, either you have different sources of light or you have a white light source, and then you have a filter that just selects one color. So that's directed onto the object, and then the, uh, and then the, the tags fluoresce. They produce a uh, different color light. It's longer wavelength light, so blue light, for instance, in this, sam this example, can produce fluorescent light that's green, and then the green goes up into the eyepiece, and then you have a filter here. A lot of the blue light will be scattered up there, so you have a filter that filters out the blue light and allows the green light to go through. And so then you can eat, and then you can make images of, of different colors and then superimpose them to get the pictures, for instance, like we saw at the very beginning. And there must, there's hundreds of different types of dyes that operate at all different, different wavelengths. Um, it's a company called Invitrogen that sells many of these. And they're also, the dyes are connected to some, like for instance, an antibody, which in the antibody is, it specifically binds to some object within the cell. And so this shows the range of wavelengths. You can get blue dye, blue fluorescent dyes, um, uh, and uh, red, you know, all, all the colors down to red, and then even beyond that, there's some dyes that operate in the near infrared. And so, you, again, you can see images like this where the the object has, in this case, it looks like three different colored dyes uh, that are all labeling different structures within the cell. And in this case, most likely, the green image was taken, the blue image was taken, and a, and a pink or red image, and then they're just uh, recombined with a computer to get the final image. And here's a quick example of how these antibody labels work. So here's a, these are uh, tubulin fibers uh, within a cell, and this shows the absorption picture on the left, and this is the fluorescent picture where a uh, certain antibody that attaches only to uh, these fibers or tubulin fibers has now labeled these and delivered a fluorescent dye. So and the way that works is the, there's some structure on the object of interest and then you uh, find an antibody that attaches to that structure and only that structure. And then usually you have these secondary antibodies that have fluorescent dyes on them and they're configured so that they attach to the first antibody or the primary antibody. And so that's that's one scenario for doing fluorescent labeling of specific structures within the cell. Okay, so this goes till three, is that right? Um, so the rest of the examples, so these, so those are kind of common everyday techniques. You'll find those in virtually every um, biology lab. Uh, at, at every, you know, probably uh, even high schools have these sorts of devices, but certainly every research center, university, um, biotech company would have these kinds of microscopes. Okay, so now this gets to a little higher level of sophistication now, so kind of unusual effects that have been developed maybe over the last couple decades. So there's an interesting story about this kind of microscope. So there's a guy... Uh, Mark, what's his name? Um, he used to be the head of the MIT Media Lab. Um, Marvin, can't remember his last name now. Um, anyway, he was a student at MIT, and he was working late at night, and taking. And he was uh, his project or his thesis project was doing microscopy, and he was looking at some object. Let's call it a cell, and. Um, he found out there was too much light going in his detector, so he had a he had a, a scanning microscope that just scanned over the uh, uh, over the object and then built up the image from that. So he took a piece of paper and he poked a hole in the piece of paper and he put it over the detector with the intent of just kind of reducing the amount of light that got in the detector so it wasn't saturated. And then he looked at his sample and and lo and behold, he you know he found that the resolution of the of what he was seeing was greatly improved and that um, he could actually see now the sample in sort of 3D. And so this has turned into 
is a well-developed technique called confocal microscope that basically uses a pinhole in front of the detector and can also use a pinhole in front of the light source. And here the idea is that usually when you illuminate a sample, uh, light from all parts of the sample get detected. But with this scheme, so here it shows light from, say, the focal, that you, you say you're focusing on the center of the sample, and light from the center gets refocused to a point and then it passes through the pinhole and is detected. But light from other parts of the sample, say above or below it, uh, they don't focus to the place where the pinhole is. They either focus in front of it or behind it, and so only a small amount of light from, from, the focal, from uh, areas outside of the focal plane get into the detector. And so, again, it gives you higher resolution. So this gives you a comparison of a confocal microscope and a conventional microscope looking at a fluorescent stain Drosophila embryo. And so you can see this kind of improvement that you get um, by using this confocal microscope. And again, this is a scheme where you're not looking at the entire image at once. You're just looking at a, a point at, uh, at any given time, and then you scan that point back and forth over the sample and use a computer to reconstruct what the sample looked like. So it gives you higher resolution and it also gives you this 3D effect. So you can, um, it's called optical sectioning. And in fact, that was mainly, remember the uh, tomographic image we got that was partially made through this technique. And so again, because only light from the focal plane gets into the, into the detector, you can move the focal plane up and down and scan through the object. So this just shows an example of pollen, a pollen grain. This is probably the top or the bottom of the pollen grain. This is the side. These are internal structures. So, um, so, so again, it's a way of getting light mainly from the focal plane and not from above or below it, excluding light. <coughs> and then the one problem with that technique is that the you have to scan this one pinhole back and forth and it can take quite a bit of time to gather together the whole image. So there's a way of automating that, and that is by using multiple pinholes and each individual pinhole is, is uh, collecting light for a portion of the image and then the pinholes spin so that they scan over the, uh, the whole image and then instead of using a single detector, you use a camera down here. And um, skip past this. And so then you end up having, you can get images like this. And in fact, Frank, who was responsible to a degree for these images, I asked him to explain what you're seeing here. So, yeah. so basically, in using the, the stained disk uh, microscope, we're able to collect 3D movies. Yeah, because it's, it's acquiring images so quickly. Right? And what people were saying before about how it takes time for a conventional confocal microscope to collect all these images. This setup allows us to take uh, images at a rate of 600 frames a second. And so as a result, you can get a very nice stack of images through a cell and be able to do it at the new rate. So 60, 60 images per, per second to, uh, to get a video. So what you're seeing here is actually a fluorescence video of a cell infected, a T cell infected with HIV. Um, That's so so um, yeah, that, that picture there with the the dotted line is a big contrast image, which shows you the infected cell that's in direct contact with two other CD4 positive T cells. Now, the, the two cells outlined in red are not infected, and so therefore, under fluorescence, they don't show up with any color. You can't see it. <coughs> in this but case, only so. the cell that's infected, you actually see fluorescence, and that fluorescence comes from the HIV. So, so these are these are movies that allow you to see that uh, over time. The HIV doesn't appear to be swimming around in free form. It actually transmits from cell to cell through direct contact. So, um, so this is a, a major finding for anybody doing HIV research and for anybody interested in developing an um, AIDS vaccine. Um, if you develop a drug, assuming that the uh, free virus is out there for you to attack, you'd be wrong because uh, based on what we've seen <coughs> so far, the HIV is constantly high. In, it's either in one infected cell or it's about to infect another cell, but it, it's never out in the world. And so, um, this isn't meant to explain how much I need to in the blood, per se, but uh, in, in the back issue, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 
we believe that this is probably the reason that we have to So, yeah, we just got a paper or a publication time. So here's an infected cell, and uh, the at least uh, some proteins related to the virus are labeled with this fluorescent dye, and you can see it directly infecting an uninfected cell. And here you can't see the other uninfected cell over here, um, but that's the, the same process is going on. And here's the sa similar images that again are reconstructed so that you can look at them in 3D. Yeah, you can see the frame of that movie and then take that picture and rotate it. Right, that's what you're seeing on the left. And then on the right, basically you can just replay that movie from an entirely different angle because you have a 3D image. So it's taken slices through the whole thing and then it's re... So it's got information about the, the whole cell and then it the computer can rebuild that, so now you can look at it uh, in different ways, so from different angles. So it's the same movie. So now there's another technique. So that was confocal mic microscopy. So there are the ideas to use a pinhole in front of the detector, and you can get 3D, and you can get a, a better resolution. So there's something called deconvolution microscopy, that does something very similar, but it uses kind of mathematical techniques. So here I'll just walk you through an example. So if you start with a, a point source, it's truly, you know, just a, just a very small source that's um, below, the, say, the resolution of the microscope. Um, and then uh, when you image that, um, you'll get something that looks like this, which is called a point spread function of the microscope. And again, that can be due to uh, aberrations in the microscope, and it can be due to this diffraction effect. Remember before we said, no matter what you do, uh, there's a certain minimum resolution that you're going to be able to get, and so you end up with this blur. But now if you understand how that blur occurred, you can use a mathematical technique to uh, de-blur it or deconvolve it, and then uh, recover the original source. And so that works great for point sources. But it can also be used for extended sources as well, such as multiple point sources. So when you image that, you get uh, these fuzzy blobs, but then you know mathematically how to go in the reverse direction. And uh, you can, again, deconvolve this. And this is what you see in the microscope. So you can deconvolve this and then uh, recover the original uh, source. And then you can do this with uh, also um, continuous sources such as a line. And uh, anyway, and then there's this, just kind of describes some mathematical technique. So this is, again, this is called a, this is called a convolution um, uh, integral. <coughs> so you have, with, again, this sort of point spread function, which is this blurry thing. And then you have the real intensity of the object and then M is what you end up measuring. And then the, there's various techniques for, t you start with what you, what you measured, and if you know what the point spread function is, you can recover what the real object is to a degree. And so this is somewhat limited by the, sig the noise in the, in the sample. If you had a noiseless image, then you could kind of perfectly recover the, uh, uh, the original object. But because all images are somewhat noisy, you can't do a perfect job. So here's some examples. Again, these are chromosomes. So this is uh, this image is deconvolved, and, and this is the sort of improvement that you can get. Uh, this is off the Olympus website, showing again improvements using deconvolution. And in fact, deconvolution is can also is uh, can be used to remove motion blurring. Um, so. Uh, not common, not something common that you do with microscopy, but in imaging, you can use the same sort of deconvolution techniques for, uh, you know, removing blur in, in images and recovering their the original uh, objects. Now, something that you, interesting that you can do with uh, uh, confocal microscopes is you can actually see single fluorescent molecules. So you, it's a way. Um, which is fairly amazing. And so, again, you take advantage of the fact that 
only the light is coming from the surface. And so, uh, so, so what you need to do to see single molecules is kind of remove as much of the noise as possible. So you maximize, maximize the signal to noise. You want to collect as much of the light as you possibly can. So you use a large numerical aperture. And then, um, and then you want to try to minimize uh, other, other background from other areas. So you use a, a uh, confocal microscope. And you can get images like this. These are single fluorescent dyes that are spread out on a microscope slide. And again, you can't resolve these. These are too small to actually measure their size, but you can certainly see that they're, they're there. And then you can, once you scan over this uh, sample and see where they are, you can go, you can steer the, the microscope back and look at individual uh, molecules, and you can see interesting things about the molecules. You can see their, the spectrum from a single molecule. It tends to change uh, fairly quickly with time. Uh, single fluorescent molecules, it turns out, frequently blink. They turn on and off, and then they become dim and bright again, and so you can keep track of the intensity it's produced. Eventually, all fluorescent molecules will bleach. That is, they, uh, some bond is broken in the fluorescent uh, molecule. It's some sort of uh, photochemical reaction, and then they go black. And so that's what's happened here. And after that, they'll, they don't fluoresce any longer. And then you can measure other interesting uh, dynamics from these single molecules. And here was a, a description of a project where uh, a group tried to use sing, uh, detection of single molecules to do kind of the ultimate uh, assay, and that is assaying single molecules. And they use what's called a total internal ref reflection microscope, where uh, light comes in and it's totally... Uh, reflected because the angle is, is such that, um, you know, if you get in a swimming pool and you get below the surface and you look up, uh, at, there is an angle beyond which you can't see outside the water anymore because you're beyond this angle of total internal reflection. But what does happen is you, there's some, uh, some electromagnetic radiation, some light that is right at the surface of the, of the microscope slide. And so if there are fluorescent dyes fluorescent molecules at the surface, they'll be excited and produce fluorescence, but, but uh, fluorescent molecules that are farther away, uh, they won't get excited because you've used this technique. <coughs> and so here's the microscope, and they, what they're doing is they're flowing um, l labeled uh, 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 proteins past here, and they're labeled with single fluorescent dyes. And I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this movie, but um, this shows, without the flow, this is just a static image of the, um, uh, of, of single molecules. And you can see how they blink and eventually they, they all um, uh, bleach away. And so it's, you know, unfortunately you can't see that hit that well on the screen there. Okay, so just cruising through the last few here uh, techniques you know, sort of advanced techniques. So there's something called two-photon excitation. So with modern lasers, they are able to produce such a very high intensity burst of light that you can get multiple photons uh, arriving at a, one molecule at the same time. And so what you can do is use two weaker photons. And because these two weak photons have arrived at the same time, they have the same effect as, as having a single... Um, higher energy photon, and so uh, so that's so one benefit you can get is that these weaker photons are able to penetrate more deeply into tissue uh, and still cause fluorescence. The other uh, advantage is that when you focus the light down, it's only in the region of the very high in, highest intensity that you get this effect. That, uh, the effect of having photons arrive at the same place at the at the same time, and so it's kind of a why are they going deeper? Uh, because they have longer wavelengths. So usually, typically, longer wavelength. So uh, low energy photons are correspond to longer wavelengths. Longer wavelengths correspond to deeper penetration. So uh, red light is long wavelength. It goes through um, tissue fairly easily. But if this was, if this laser was green, or you can uh, Frank can just show you. You know. Uh, <laughs> Green light. I mean, you know, you know this. You tried this before. 
green light doesn't go through. Oh, that's pretty cool. So red is longer wavelength. Red won't go through your finger. So that's the advantage. That's one advantage here. The other advantage is that you can kind of make a confocal microscope without uh, having these pinholes and so forth. So, so here, so here's a microscope objective, just a normal. So this and this is a fluorescent dye in this cuvette, and um, here they've used shorter wavelength light, say it's uh, green light, for instance, and uh, it has enough energy to excite the fluorescent dye, but you can see that the fluorescence in the liquid, in the fluorescent liquid, it's excited all along the path of the, of the, uh, of the light. So from this objective, though, there's high intensity, uh, longer wavelength light, and it's focused down, and it's only at this point here, if you can see that, where the the um, the light reaches such an intensity <coughs> that multiple photons are arriving at the same molecule at the same time, so you can get this uh, two photon or multi photon uh, effect. So again, the advantage is you can get deeper penetration, you can get higher resolutions because you're only exciting in a uh, in the focal plane, and you can again do this kind of, this uh, 3D sectioning. I think I'll skip this because this will be the subject of um, James. James's. Yeah. In fact. So what we've been talking about before, so we've been talking about elastically scattered light. That's light that... Um, you start with one wavelength, it scatters off of the, of the sample, and it comes back having exactly the same uh, wavelength. So it's called elastic scattering because the outgoing photons have the same energy as the incoming photons. And so here's an example, it's called inelastic scattering, and there's another name for inelastic scattering, it's called Raman scattering. And that's where the light that comes out has a different wavelength at, uh, compared to the light going in. And the reason it has a different wavelength on the way out is because it's lost some of its energy in the in the sample, and the way it's lost its energy is by exciting certain vibrational bands in the sample. And so, um, and by analyzing the light that comes out, you can get a sort of spectrum um, of the energies of the photons coming out, and then they have peaks, and the peaks uh, in the spectrum correspond to the energies of the of the vibrations in the sample. So you can, and the energies of vibrations within the sample are fairly unique to the different materials in the sample. So you can kind of get a biochemical inventory of what materials, what molecules are within the sample. And so then you can take this beam and you can scan it over the object and get an image. And so here, for instance, these are uh, sperm cells and the uh, the yellow corresponds to protein peaks within the spectrum, and the blue corresponds to peaks that are related to DNA. And so you can see that this sperm cell has no DNA in it, but this one does, has DNA located in the head of the sperm. And so this is done pretty much uh, non-invasively. And I think I will skip this part. So it's a way of doing, uh, it's called CARS, it's a way of doing a higher... Uh, uh, are doing the same thing, but with much greater efficiency. Okay, so now the last few things I wanted to tell you about are there's a number of schemes that remember we call what was called the diffraction limit. That was what limits the resolution of, of uh, all conventional microscopes. But people they haven't shown that the, the diffraction limit is wrong, but they figured out ways of getting around it and. Uh, are able to build microscopes that have higher resolutions than than conventional microscopes, and so the first scheme, and this is this is one that's been known for a while since uh, 1984. So here the idea is you make a a pinhole that's very small, much smaller than the wavelength of of the light, and then you scan it over the object. <coughs> now, just because it's shown in this diagram. 
the problem here is that uh, when you shine light through a small aperture, yes, right near the aperture, uh, the light is confined to a small region, but very quickly it spreads out and you kind of lose this effect. So people have built these devices. They're called near-field uh, scanning uh, optical microscopy systems. So they take a capillary and they pull it down to a point and they, they coat the outside with metal and then they shine light through it. The metal is to keep the light from leaking out the side. And so then the light leaks out at the end and then the, the size of the tip, the opening in the tip is sort of 10 nanometers. And this is maybe 100 to 200, well, uh, it's 10 to uh, 20 times smaller than what you get uh, with a normal microscope. And now you scan this over a surface and you can get uh, fairly high resolutions. So here shows just a schematic. These are objects on a surface and this, this tip is then scanned over the surface and the amount of light that goes through it is recorded by a, uh, by a, a detector. And so you can uh, see single molecules this way. You, again, you can't resolve them, but you can find where they are. And then here, this is kind of a standard object to look at, tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, and it's used because the diameter of these viral particles is well known. It's 18 nanometers. So here you can see that, again, normal microscopes can see sort of things that are down to two to 300 nanometers, but this is like 20 nanometers, and it, it can resolve that. Now the only, so this is pretty cool, the only thing is that it's somewhat complicated and it can only see the surface, you can't see inside of uh, objects such as cells, so so it, it has some advantages but some disadvantages. But ultimately the resolution you get is dependent on how, how thinly you can right. identify Right, pretty much, yeah. And then the smaller the hole, uh, the less light that comes out too, so. And then also the smaller the hole, the closer you have to um, have it to the surface. I mean, it, it typically has to be kind of a within the diameter of the hole. You know, the sur otherwise the, the the advantage of the small hole is is lost. Okay, so here's another scheme, and we actually have this microscope at the Center for Biophotonics. It was developed partially with funds from the center, and it was developed by a group of researchers at UCSF, and then the Center for Biophotonics helped to commercialize it. There's a company called Applied Precision in, um, in Seattle. And then we've gotten the very first prototype. And the way it works is uh, by using the following example. So imagine you have some sort of object. And just for this demonstration, the object is very simple. It's just a pattern of lines, but then with some wiggles in the line. And so imagine that the microscope is, these lines are too fine for the microscope to see. They're too small. And so now, instead of illuminating the sample in the normal way with uniform light, you illuminate it with a pattern of light. And what happens is, I hope, um, you produce these moiré fringes. So these broader, more coarse uh, lines are produced. And now these coarse lines can be observed with the microscope, and they can be recorded uh, with a camera. And so now you take you know, uh, many tens of these images, you know, say maybe 50 of these images, where the pattern is at different orientation and different angles, and then you use a computer to reconstruct and answer the question, well, if I see these moiré patterns and I know what the illumination pattern is, what must the unknown pattern have been in order to produce those moiré images? And so, uh, the straightforward application of this, you can get automatically a kind of factor of two improvement in the resolution of the microscope. Did you notice you got more fringes anyway? Yeah, from the camera, or from the, uh, um, yeah, from the display, and also the, the illumination pattern is also pixelated, so you get other, you know, you get multiple effects, yeah. So here's some uh, things you can do. So here's a multi here's a uh, conventional image of actin filaments in a HeLa cell uh, without structured illumination and with structured illumination. Um, here, this uses a kind of super, it's called uh, saturated structured illumination, but you can get like a factor of five improvement instead of just two in the resolution. So 
Here are some fluorescent beads spread on a microscope slide, and this is the conventional image that you get out of using a normal microscope. And then using this structured illumination technique, you can actually resolve these 50 nanometer beads, which are, again, the, the, these beads are uh, five times smaller than uh, what a conventional microscope is usually capable of. And here this shows uh, chromosomes in a Drosophila embryo uh, uh, using conventional microscope. And, uh, and structured illumination. This requires fluorescent. In order for this to work, you need to use fluorescent staining. But again, it's a way to get to um, obtain images that are beyond the resolution of a normal microscope. So that's one scheme. Here's a second scheme called uh, STED, uh, Stimulated Emission Depletion. And that is, um, so when you shine light, so if you have a point uh, source of light, and you shine that, and you look at it through a microscope, you get this kind of point spread function. And if it's fluorescent light, you, um, you know, you, get, you see the fluorescent, you see the, uh, well, if it's a fluorescent sample, you see the fluorescent light. And then, but then you can do something else, and that is you can come in with another color laser, and you can, um, it's called stimulated emission. It basically, it turns off the fluorescent in, uh, in, a, in a, a region here, and so you can make this point spread function smaller and smaller until it becomes a, just a point. And then you scan this point over the, uh, over the sample, and it's a way of then producing an image with much higher resolution uh, than using conventional techniques. And so again, this can typically get something like a five times improvement in, in resolution, and it uh, uh, it's also developed into a commercial system. And I've kind of skimmed over the little details here, but uh, uh, we, we could talk about that later. And this just shows an example of how the, how the, the beam, the very small um, region that fluoresces, is scanned <coughs> over an object, and you can get a high-resolution picture. Okay, so then the last technique it, it actually can be used with a pretty much conventional microscope, and, re, and really the, the innovation that allows this to work is in, the, is in the labels, the fluorescent labels that are used to label the object. And so these fluorescent labels are called uh, photoactivatable fluorescent uh, dyes, and often they can be uh, actually fluorescent proteins that are produced by the cell itself. <coughs> and so they, these fluorescent um, labels have kind of two states. So one is an inactive state where it's non-fluorescent. And then if you shine wavelength, uh, light of a certain wavelength, you, then they can become fluorescent. So they're not fluorescing, but now they have the potential to fluoresce. And so that's step two. And then um, step three is now you turn on the, the, the wavelength that causes them to fluoresce, and then they begin emitting fluorescent light. And then eventually they'll bleach. If, uh, once you illuminate them for a certain amount of time, then they, they become permanently non-fluorescent. So this scheme here for the next um, a technique, it's called PALM, which is photoactivatable localization microscopy. And the way that works is, okay, you have your cell. It's labeled with these photoactivatable uh, labels or dyes. You use the short wavelength and you switch all of them off. And so now they've become completely non-fluorescent. And now you use the sort of weak um, uh, 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 wavelength to turn just a few of them back on. Now they become, um, a few of them become fluorescent. And then you, you use the fluorescent light to image those isolated fluorescent molecules. And you can, you can kind of locate where, where the individual molecules are, and then by doing this kind of deconvolution technique, you can uh, identify sort of the centroids of each one of those molecules to say something like 10 nanometers or a few nanometers. And then eventually those, dye, those fluorescent molecules will bleach, and then you use the, uh, the illumination to turn a few more of them on. And so then you measure a few more points. And then you keep going through this cycle over and over, maybe 10,000 times. And now you've built up your image from these individual points. And, you, and the, the 
uh, resolution of every point is within like 10 nanometers. So, so therefore, the spatial resolution of the whole object is is of order 10 nanometers. So this is kind of a this just shows uh, a, a sample and a time is going from the top to the bottom. And so every time point, you've illuminated a few of these. A uh, few of the molecules, and then you record where those are. And after the end of the experiment, you reassemble all those points, and you and you get a uh, an image of the uh, a high resolution image of the object. And sort of one amusing thing about this is this guy who invented this t technique, uh, Eric Betzig. Uh, the very first one he built, he built it in his living room. Um, and so it just sort of proves that you can still do cutting edge science, you know, in your home. Um, and this is a picture out of Science uh, magazine. So I think that was all I wanted to say. No, no more questions. No. So I believe that you know now what's happening are some of these techniques are being combined. You know, structured illumination and palm and. Uh, uh, stead and palm and so forth to kind of get the benefits of and they're also being refined and and it's likely I mean these techniques all appeared within just a few years within just the last few years and so it seems likely that there's going to be more techniques that people are going to develop that allow you to to see um, cells at higher resolution so remember at the beginning we say the one that said that the one disadvantage of optical microscopy was it didn't have enough resolution to see the things you really wanted to see, but now there are techniques being developed. So the one holy grail, the one thing you still can't do very well, even with these techniques, is you notice that um, the high resolution techniques uh, typically take quite a bit of time. The stead technique, or the uh, structured illumination, illumination technique, you, you have to take 50 individual images in order to get the, the final image. And then palm, you have to take kind of 10,000 individual images before you can re... So what, therefore, what you can't do is do live cell imaging. You can't, do, you can't uh, take the required number of individual images fast enough to, to look at moving objects. So that's still a kind of unanswered goal, uh, is to get both high resolution and time res uh, high spatial resolution and time resolution at the same time. That's still kind of the, the holy grail of optical imaging. All the all of the high resolution techniques here are basically fluorescence uh, techniques. Right. Um, if you have any other type of sample that produces, you know, bright point sources, like getting yep. your dark field scattered. Yeah. Couldn't, there, couldn't you develop a high-resolution high method to do dark field? Well, so with, uh, it turns out with uh, structured illumination, so the answer is yes, but here, with structured illumination, it assumes that the emission from the sample is isotropic, that's equal intensity at all, in all directions. Um, if most of it is scattered in a specific direction, <coughs> you need to either account for that and people haven't worked out the math for that and some say it can't be done um, but uh, but the present technique the present way of doing it can't be used again because the light doesn't come out in all directions and that and with fluorescence the light does come out in all directions equally with stead you know that requires the whole basic basis of the ideas requires fluorescence now, uh, if you had some sort of object that just could be switched on and off, that wasn't fluorescence, then you could use palm. That would work okay. So, <coughs> and, and have, have near field optics completely hide, or is there still yeah, usually um, it's they're so difficult to use, and uh, and they can only see the surface, and they break fairly easily. I guess Thomas Huser, he that's what he did his thesis work on that they've all moved away from this near field scheme to far field. They sacrifice some resolution, but just the convenience of just popping in a, a sample and being able to see the, you know, a, a fairly high resolution still. <coughs> and the other thing, I think with bio, there's issues with biological material because it's not very stiff. So when you scan this tip over the surface, you can 
you can move this. You know, the surface isn't. Uh, it's more elastic, and you can be. You know, you can you can deform the surface. So there's issues related to that. It's not impossible to deal with. But. Had enough? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sure. Yep. And so, you know, um, I'm sure both. Of you, have you been to Center for Biophotonics? If you're. Yeah. Oh, did you come for a tour or a visit? Or okay, you're certainly both welcome anytime to come for a visit. Open our line. Yep. Great. Right. Be yeah. Yep. I mean, we had. Uh, um, so you're a medical student no, or PhD student. PhD student? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. No, we've had a number of interns at all levels of education. So. Including faculty people that spent some time there. So.